Okay, so good afternoon. So is everything, do you have any questions or comments? So last time we were talking about group homomorphisms. So I don't say much about it. You know, it's the obvious thing. You have a, it's a map phi from one group to another, which is compatible with the product. So if I take the uh, image of the product, it's the product of the images in the second group. Okay. Now, and then we had to introduce the image. Um, so phi of G is the image of G. And we have the kernel. This is the set of all elements which are mapped to the unit element in the second group. So I could write this as p to the minus 1 of 1. And uh, it, uh, you know, we know that uh, this homomorphism is injective if and only if the kernel consists only of the identity element of G. Um, then we had looked, uh, in particular, if, uh, say, H, and so one thing is that the, the image is a subgroup of G, subgroup of H, and uh, the kernel is a normal subgroup. Of uh, the source G. At any rate, <coughs> we can also look at the case if um, we have um, a group G and N a normal subgroup. We can form uh, the quotient group, which is a group. And um, then we actually have the natural map G, the natural projection G P from G to G mod N, which sends uh, uh, an element to the corresponding coset. And this is a group homomorphism. And uh, finally, we had uh, the homomorphism theorem, which says that if I have a subjective uh, morphism between groups, so let uh, phi from G mod H be subjective morphism, subjective homomorphism. Um, then we can factor it through the quotient group. So then, so let's say by the kernel. So let k be the kernel of phi. Then uh, there exists a morphism phi bar from um, G mod K to H morphism such that this map factors uh, via the quotient map, so such that phi is equal to phi bar composed with pi. So in, uh, and here we have set a subjective morphism, so actually this is an isomorphism. So up to isomorphism, every subjective morphism is just dividing by a normal subgroup. Okay, so that uh, was more or less the last thing we did. Now um, we come to a new topic, which is group operations. Hope you can 
So I think I mentioned in the first lecture that originally groups were always viewed as groups of symmetry. So groups uh, are often related to symmetry. And so that means you have some, some object and the group will be the set of, uh, will somehow be all the things you can do with it without changing that thing. So for instance, if you, a typical example would be you have a, a square. And you ask yourself, what are the kind of reflections and rotations in the plane that you can do so that the square is mapped into itself? This would be this uh, set of reflections and rotation would turn out to be a group. Um, <coughs> so, so groups are often so are somehow symmetry groups. So, um, so for instance, we can look at uh, the uh, reflections and rotations of um, a square. So <coughs> this uh, kind of this means somehow that uh, every element in the group will somehow move the points in the square. And uh, <coughs> now more so, so one can uh, express this in a different way that we have a group operation, that a group operates on a set. So <coughs> that means that we have a group. So if G is a group, and x is a set. So somehow an operation will be a way how you can, you know, if you take an element x here, you can apply to it in some way an element of the group to get an other, other element in x in such a way that it's somehow compatible with, the, with being a group. So the only structure you have for a group is that it <coughs> you can multiply elements, so it should somehow be. Uh, so what you want is if you have G in G and X in X, you want to somehow associate it to that GX in G times X in X. So the operation of G on X. <coughs> and so let me. Uh, as I said, compatible with the with the fact that G is a group. So let me write this down properly. So definition: Let G be a group. X a non-empty set. So. Actually, need yeah, uh, an operation, or one says also action of G on X, is um, a map which looks like multiplication. So, is a, is a map. So, I also noted by that dot, like the product in the group, but it's different. So dot from G times X to X, which sends a pair of a group element and an element in this set X to something that we call G times X. Uh, such that somehow some reason pro reasonable properties are fulfilled. The first one is, that the neutral element in the group shouldn't do anything. So I have such that first 1 times x is equal to x for all x in x. And the second statement is that it should be compatible with the product in the group. So that means if we take 
the product of two elements in the group and apply it to x. This is the same as if we first apply one and then we apply the other. So note that this is, um, you know, this is sometimes called a, uh, maybe associative law, but it's not really because here, this is the product in the group, and here we have twice applied the action. But you know, we want it to be compatible so that the product you know, acts uh, as twice applying the, as uh, applying one element after the other. Okay. So um, also we usually say so if uh, we have an action we uh, an action of g on x we say uh, g acts on x so let's look at maybe some examples. So <clears throat> there are, as usual, there are stupid examples. So the most stupid one is the action of the group, which doesn't do anything at all. So we have the trivial action. So we have G is a group. And uh, x is a set, and we define uh, g times x for g in g and x in x to be x for all x in x and g in g. So this means that uh, every element in g acts by not acting at all, by just sending every element to itself. So this is obviously in action because, uh, you know, nothing happens and these conditions are somehow void. <laughs> then another case uh, is the symmetric group, which acts uh, in a natural way on the set 1 to n, because that's the way how it is actually defined, the symmetric group. So Sn acts on uh, the set 1n in the obvious way. You know, the symmetric group consists of um, all bijections of the set 1n to itself. And so we let it act on the set by applying the corresponding bijection to the element. So by, so if sigma is an element in Sn times some number k, which is an element in 1n, is defined to be sigma of k. And now, <coughs> again, it is clear that this is, a, this is a, an operation. Um, you know, I just say, um, because obviously the neutral element of Sn is the identity map. And the identity map maps every element to itself. So that's precisely what's required there. And um, the product in the symmetric group is defined as the composition of maps. And so it just says if I take tau times sigma, tau times sigma times k times k, uh, applied to k, this is, you know, sigma tau applied to sigma of k, which is just a, uh, okay, so this is, um, you know, this is again, by definition, this is clear. Now the, as I said, the group structure sigma tau it has been defined to be sigma composed with tau. So the group structure is this. 
And so, therefore, uh, obviously, this is the case. So, <coughs> then, you know, we have an, some other action. For instance, we have some actions of the group on itself. So, so if G is a group, um, then I have, for instance, uh, the left translation. So, left translation is a map from G times G to G which sends, um, well, which is just actually the product in the group itself. So uh, G comma H is mapped to G times H. Now this is the product in the group. I claim that just multiplying in the group is also an operation. This is completely clear because if I multiply an element in the group with one, you know, it's a neutral element, I map it to itself, and then, then this, um, you know, as now the group operation is really just the multiplication, the second statement just becomes the associative law. Um, So, so one uh, remark that we can make is that if um, I have an operation of uh, a group on a set, then every element in the group defines a bijection of the set to itself by just kind of applying the element in the group to the elements in the set. So this is... Um, um, follow so I make this a definition so let G act on a non-empty set X uh, so then we have the map so for G and G, we have the multiplication by G. Which is MG from X to X, which sends an element X and X to G times X. Okay, and the claim is that this bijection, so mg. Well, that is kind of obvious because um, you can easily see um, if you apply m of g to the minus 1, this will be the inverse map. So let's spell this out. I mean, first I want to see, so obviously, uh, uh, note we have m of 1 is equal to the identity map of x, so which sends every element x to itself, well, because that's what this axiom says, that the element 1 in the group sends every element to itself. And... Um, So therefore, maybe I leave the action for a moment. If I take any element G and I form MG composed with say M G to the minus one of the inverse element in the group, uh, and we apply this to any element X, so for all X and X. Um, what do we have? Well, this is 
uh, g to the minus 1 times x. So the operation in this way, which uh, according to our axiom was this. So this is 1, and so this is equal to x. So we see, therefore, that um, this composition is the identity. And obviously, in the same way, we have that m g to the minus 1 composed with m g is the identity on x. So we see that uh, uh, this map m g is a bijection because we can say what its inverse map is. It's just a map associated to the inverse element. So <coughs> m g is a bijection. So in other words, we have that m g can be viewed as an element of the symmetric group of x for the set of all bijections uh, of x to itself. Now we want to use this to prove uh, so-called Cayley's theorem, which is actually not, you know, not very difficult, but it's a useful thing. So we have the theorem. It's called supposed to be due to Cayley, Cayley's theorem. Maybe it's not in complete generality. So I say every finite group is a subgroup um, maybe I call the group G is a subgroup of some symmetric group. Yeah, you're right. It's isomorphic to a subgroup. Yeah. That's certainly true. Thank you. Every finite group, G, is isomorphic to a subgroup um, of a symmetric group. So Sn, so a symmetric group in n letters. Um, in fact, um, G is isomorphic to a subgroup of a symmetric group with n as many letters as G has elements. Okay, so, and you know, in some sense, maybe it's not completely obvious, but we have essentially already seen it. So we have to somehow see how every element in the group will act as a bijection of the group uh, to itself. Well, and it does by the group acting on itself by left translation. So let's do that. So proof um, So after all, if we take the symmetric group on G, so just the set of bijections of G to itself, this is, as we know, isomorphic to the symmetric group in, uh, you know, so maybe just like this, equal to Sn for n equal to the number of elements of G. So we want to show that, so we have to show that uh, uh, G is isomorphic to a subgroup of the bijections of G to itself.
And so for this, so first I you know, make a tiny lemma. So this is the statement uh, is a bit more general. So if let G, so let G act on a set on a uh, non-empty set X, and uh, we have seen in this definition that uh, then this uh, so for then the map we have this map M from G to the symmetric group symmetric uh, group on X so the set of projection of X to itself which sends any element G to MG we have here, if uh, a group G acts on a non-empty set, we have for every element G in G, we can multiply by it in this form, you know, just apply G to X for all X, and this gives a projection of X to itself, so an element in SX. So we have this map here, and the claim is, and this is a group homomorphism. This is also kind of obvious, but I want to state. <coughs> yes? Mm, what? Yeah, no, I don't think it's really necessary. I just. Uh, um, you know, it's, it's isomorphic to a symmetric group on, you know, it, I think it is true that if G is, it's true for every group, obviously finite or non-finite, that G is isomorphic to a subgroup of S of G. You know? But here I wanted it to be a subset of a finite, you know, isomorphic to a subgroup of a finite symmetric group, then obviously it has to be finite, but you're right. So uh, the proof also will show that, so you know, more generally. Um, um, so for any G, um, G is isomorphic to, uh, is isomorphic to a subgroup of S of G. But I'm not so sure how useful that practically is because, you know, if G is infinite, then S of G will be very large. So then, <laughs> um, but uh, you are right uh, that this is not, uh, I, I just stated it uh, in this simpler way, right, but uh, there's no need for this assumption. But obviously I want here just a finite symmetric group. Okay, so we want to see that. That's kind of, so here we want to see that it's a homomorphism that's basically obvious. <coughs> it's a, again basically the definition. You know? So this is uh, the remark that um, so you know, just by definition we have uh, if x is an element in x um, then and g and h are elements in g then by definition if I take m g um, If I take MGH uh, of X, this is GH times X, which is G times H times X. On the other hand, H times X is MH of X. And um, um, and you know multiplying by this is M, so this is mg 
of m h of x and by definition of the uh, <coughs> and I mean the, the group structure here on the symmetric group is after all just uh, the composition so that means that m g h is equal to m g times m h okay so this is actually table but I still call it lemma and now <coughs> we want to use uh, the lemma with respect to the uh, left translation action of G on itself. So we have the left translation. So we have G times G G um, G comma H maps to G times H as a left translation. Action of G on G. Um, then with respect to this, I have the map M Uh, so, so for this, we have the group homomorphism M, which we have just uh, seen here, uh, from G to S of G. Um, <coughs> okay, which uh, was the map which sends an element G in G to the left multiplication action by G, which is a map from G to itself. So, <coughs> so with this, so the image of this map will be uh, so so M of G is a subgroup of S of G. And in order to see that G is isomorphic to a subgroup of S of G, we want to show that this map is uh, injective. So a subgroup H of S of G to show uh, G is isomorphic to H, we have to show, say that the kernel of M is equal to the element 1 in the group G. And obviously this uh, proof will work without any assumption on whether G is finite or infinite, as you noticed. So we take an element G in the kernel of M. So that means that the uh, left multiplication by G is the identity of G on to itself. So MG is equal to the identity of G. So in other words, for all H in G, we have G times H is equal to H. Now, you know, we are in a group. This is actually the multiplication in the group. So we can multiply by the inverse of H. And so we get G is equal to 1. So this was not very difficult. OK. And so this proves that the kernel consists just of the element 1. And so G is isomorphic to a subgroup 
of a symmetric group. And if G is finite, it's isomorphic to a subgroup of a finite symmetric group. Um, this actually, I think, does even play, I mean, also practical role. For instance, there are, um, so sometimes the easiest way to compute in a group is actually to represent it as a subgroup of a symmetric group and do computations in a symmetric group. And uh, uh, also in computer algebra programs, uh, there are several ways how you can represent a group. I mean, either you can, you know, if it's a non-commutative group, you can either represent it as a subgroup, as a, some group of matrices, or you can represent it as a subgroup of some symmetric group, and then actually uh, the computer algebra programs use that to, you know, do computations in groups and uh, find out uh, whether certain things can happen or not. So it's really of practical importance. There's one uh, drawback, obviously, uh, with this representation in the, uh, as a subgroup of the symmetric group, it's kind of not very efficient because according to this, uh, we have seen that um, G is isomorphic to a subgroup of Sn, where N is equal to the number of elements of G. So G is isomorphic to a subgroup uh, I mean, if G has n elements, it's isomorphic to a subgroup of a symmetric group which has n factorial elements. So it's not very, uh, but uh, still, in some cases, it's still the best you can do. Okay. So <coughs> now um, I want to get to some more concrete. Examples. So let's see. Where do I have it? So now I want to look at the example of a group which is a, a sub, which is kind of basically defined as a subgroup of a symmetric group, and you know, which I hinted in at the beginning. So the group of symmetries of a regular n-gon, which is called the dihedral group. So I first give an informal definition so that you can uh, imagine what it is, and then I just define it as a subgroup of a symmetric group. So the dihedral group Dn Uh, is the group of symmetries, so maybe n must at least be, well, I don't know, at least a positive integer. To make it meaningful, maybe we should have had it at least three, but anyway, it doesn't matter. The group of dn is uh, the group uh, of reflections and rotations uh, of a regular n-gon. So we now have this regular n-gon. I don't know what I want here, so this is a bit big. Maybe I make it uh, just four. And then there are two obvious things, I mean, symmetries of the plane I mean, that you can do in order to map it to itself. So maybe they assume the vertices are numbered one, two, three, four. Either you can uh, rotate it, maybe, for instance, by, in this case, by 90 degrees, and it maps the thing to itself. Or you can take, for instance, any. Uh, can take this dividing line and you can uh, kind of reflect it along this line. This also is a map that maps this thing to itself. And so, <coughs> um, I can do this more generally uh, for any 
such thing. So, <coughs> so we number uh, the edges. Um, so, <coughs> so, so we can can view this as a, a subgroup of uh, the symmetric group on n letters, where n is the number. For instance, if we uh, make this rotation by 90 degrees, then this will send, so here, rotation by 90 degrees will send, uh, will be the element in Sn, which sends 1 to 2, 2 to 3, 3 to 4, and 4 to 1. Oh, because, you know, I just turn it around. And if I make this reflection here, so this reflection, well, this will be what? So 1 and 2 are interchanged, and 3 and 4 are interchanged. So this is 1, 2, 2, 1, 3, 4, 4, 3. So in for these particular two elements, I have represented them as elements in the symmetric group. So one can do it what? One can do more generally. So now assume we have an n-gon. So looks like this. We have here 1, 2, whatever, 3, and it goes on. And here we have n. And then we have, so we have either the rotation by uh, 2 pi i, 2 pi divided by n, Yeah, no, yeah, yeah, but now I just make one step. Huh? So, so I have this rotation by 2 pi divided by n, which is, um, you know, in the same way as here, it sends 1 to 2, 2 to 3, n minus 1 to n, and n to 1. And we can also, so if n is equal to 2m is even, because there's also this difference between even and odd. Um, then we have here 1, 2, and so on. It goes on, and here we have, uh, what is it? Um, uh, <laughs> which one is it? So this would be, yeah, I think M m plus 1, and then it goes on until n. No? And we have here, uh, we can look at, we can reflect along this line. So reflection along this line. Um, uh, along uh, the line dividing the edge uh, 1, 2, and m, m plus 1. Uh, this is, uh, what is it? Well, we can see that it sends always each to the other one. So do I really want it like that? You know, it's maybe not so. Yeah, I prefer, well, now I've done it like this. It's kind of stupid. <laughs> yeah, it's not so. 
I'm not even sure I counted it correctly. No, I didn't. It's also counted wrong. So the way I counted it here, if I want here this, I should here well, have 1, and here should be n. And this is 2. So then it's this. So this is n1. The, okay, so we have the, the line which divides these two edges, one and this, and this will be just replace uh, any by the other. So one is sent to n, two is sent to n minus one, and so on. Uh, n is sent to one. So this is this reflection. And um, if uh, the number is odd, then it looks a bit different. So if uh, n is equal to 2m plus 1, then you know, we can look at this. We start here with 1, 2, whatever. Then uh, three, and then where do we arrive? So here we will have an edge which is opposite to this, which goes from uh, uh, see m See? Yeah, I don't want it like this. So again, I have here, call this 1, 2, and this will be, say, n. Then we do it like this, and this will be, uh, if we count correctly, this will be m and m plus 1, I hope. Then it goes on. And here there would be n minus 1. And then we come back. And so we make this reflection. Maybe we should have the angles correct. And so what does that do? Well, in this case, we have done it in such a way that n is mapped to itself, you know, because it's on the reflecting line. So reflect along the line uh, from the vertex n to the edge, so the middle point of the edge uh, between m and m plus 1. Um, and so what does it do? So it will send n to n. And then I find that 1 is sent to n minus 1, 2 to n minus 2, and so on, until, again, n minus 1 is sent to n. So in each case, we have described this thing to uh, 1, obviously. Yeah, sorry. Thank you, anyway. Um, <coughs> so, and I will call, uh, where was I? So, this rotation I will call sigma. No, I have always fixed n. And uh, uh, this uh, reflection along this line we will call tau in both cases. I hope it's correct. So what do we, and now I claim, where is this must be? Um, so now I've described, so <coughs> I, f then for me, the uh, dihedral group now, kind of the abstract 
definition will just be it's a subgroup of the symmetric group in, in n letters which is uh, generated by these two elements so 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 the dihedral group n is just the subgroup generated by sigma and tau you know so the subgroup in the symmetric group in n letters and now you can see a few things uh, quite easily so, so it's kind of easy, it's kind of clear that if I take, for instance, what is the order of sigma is obviously equal to n. No? I mean, from the picture, it's kind of clear that if we apply this n times, then we come back. But also, if you just look at it as permutation, each time it's permuted one more, and after n steps, you come back to have the identity. And um, this, if you look at this reflection, you can always see that uh, both for this tau and for this tau, also both in the even and the odd case, um, you send one element to another one, but this other element is set, sent back to the original element. So if you apply this thing twice, you get the identity. So the order of tau is equal to two. And uh, slightly more difficult to check, but you know, you just write it uh, down. So if you take tau, sigma, tau, this will be sigma to the minus one. I hope that's correct. So this is, you know, you can just check this. And the claim is now that. Mm, this, in some sense, completely describes it. So, I mean, I will not actually do it. I can call it maybe exercise. So, first at dn, I can just describe all the elements here. This is the set of all sigma to the i tau the k where i where zero is smaller or equal to i is smaller than n and zero is smaller or equal to k smaller than two and all these elements are different So, um, so the first thing is that you know, if you look at this thing, it's just its elements will just be all products of uh, powers of sigma and powers of tau in you know repeated. So any kind of words in sigma to the k, tau to the l, sigma to the k two, tau to the l k, and so on. You just have some kind of expression like this in sigma in powers of sigma and powers of tau, and then uh, one can check that if I apply these two, these in some sense three relations, that tau squared is equal to one, means that you can never, you know, you can always if you have any power of tau which occurs anywhere which is bigger or equal to two, you can eliminate it. So you have in these words only powers of um, in tau of one, mm -hmm. in the same way you have power of at most one, and for the sigma you have powers of at most n minus one, and then this relation tells you that you can, um, you know, 
move the, uh, you know, tau is equal to tau to the minus one. So you can move uh, uh, tau and sigma past each other by doing this. And so you find, if you do this inductively, that all the elements can be described in this way. And then if you just look at uh, how these are represented as, as elements of the symmetric group, you find that all these elements are actually different. And so you have completely described the group, in particular, we have that the number of elements of dn is equal to 2n. Now one should notice that this will be, if n is, uh, let me see, yeah, if n is at least 3, uh, I hope this is a non commutative group. Um, because um, you know we this relation says that tau I mean anyway maybe you can I hope it's correct with three but um, <coughs> You can check that uh, these relations tell us that this is a non-commutative group. Basically, it's just, you know, this tells you after all that if you, you know, normally this would have to, if it was com conjugate, uh, was commutative, then tau, sigma, tau, you know, and you know that tau is equal to tau to the minus one, so tau, sigma, tau to the minus one has to be equal to sigma, but it's equal to sigma to the minus one. So whenever sigma is not equal to sigma minus one, which is true whenever n is at least three, this will not be commutative. Okay, so that was uh, this one example of a uh, kind of a standard group which uh, one often encounters. Um, so now I, we want to just give a few more standard definitions for uh, group operations. So there's uh, the notion of group operation being transitive, simple transitive, and then we want to have some results about uh, counting uh, elements when, uh, you know, then we want to talk about orbits, and uh, then we want to see how one can decide maybe how many orbits there are and so on. So, <coughs> so definition. We have again let the group G act on a non empty set X. So the operation is called transitive. Well, if I can move any element of x to any other element of x by means of the operation. So that means for all elements x and y, um, for all elements x and y in x, there exists a group element such that, say, y is equal to g applied to x. Okay, so the, the group will somehow send any element of x to any other element of x by just uh, applying the action. And it's called simply transitive if there's precisely one such element for any pair. So, so it is simply transitive Um, if so, if 
for all x and y in x there exists a unique so that's what this means g in g uh, such that y is equal to g times x so <coughs> So the, one of the things that one should notice I, is that if the action is simply transitive, then G must have the same number of elements as X. So we have a bijection from G to X. So if uh, uh, G acts simply transitively, on X then uh, for any element X in X the map of multiplying by uh, so by elements of G so the map from G uh, x which sends an element g to g times x is a bijection and this is actually just the definition no because it says simply transitively means that for all x and y there exists unique g which sends uh, such as g times x is equal to y. So that, uh, and that means precisely that if I fix the x, the map from uh, g to x, which sends uh, x to gx, is a bijection. Because for any element in x, there's precisely one g such that it maps it there. So now I want to use two other words which uh, are important when one is dealing with group actions which are the orbits and the stabilizer of an element. So definition. So if uh, again we have G X on X. Non empty set. Then uh, for any element x in x, the orbit of x which I just denote gx, well, it's just all the elements, uh, I mean, that uh, X is sent to by multiplying uh, with elements of G. So this is the set of all G times X with G in G. And any subset, so a subset Y in X, which is of this form, is called an orbit. Uh, such that y is equal to gx for some x and x is called an orbit of the action. So you know, if one compares to this word we had just introduced here, we see that obviously um, uh, the action is transitive. If and only if 
for any x in x, we have that the orbit of x is equal to the whole of x. Um, so we can also define, we can also see that the orbits are certain equivalence classes of a uh, of an equivalence relation on X, which therefore means that X is a disjoint union of orbits for the action. So we have an equivalence relation. on x by saying that uh, x is equivalent to y if and only if there exists an element g in g such that y is equal to g times x. Again, it's uh, straightforward to see that this is an equivalence relation. Uh, I think you can certainly see that. And uh, so it is also clear that the orbits of x of the g action uh, are equal, are precisely the equivalence classes. In fact, if I take the equivalence class of an element x in x, this is the orbit of x. So one usually calls the, the set of equivalence classes with respect to this equivalence relation um, in other words, the set of orbits uh, is called uh, orbit space and denoted x divided by g. And, uh, you know, these are things that such things one studies quite a lot in also in algebraic geometry, but okay. So then another thing that we have is the stabilizer. So the stabilizer will consist of all the elements in G which do not move X, so such as G times X is equal to X. Again, our wonderful group action. So the stabilizer is that right it's like a bit here. Um, of an element X in X is um, but for the moment, un unless it needs to confusion, I denote G lower X. But if you find these two similar, we can decide on a different notation, which is just a set of all elements uh, G in G, such that uh, G times X is equal to x. So this is some subset of g. In fact, it is clear, no, because the product of two elements in the stabilizer and the stabilizer and the inverse of an element in the stabilizer will be in the stabilizer that gx is a subgroup of g. So just by definition. Oh, 
we have the following simple observation to relate the number, so the size of an orbit to the number of elements of the stabilizer. So lemma. So we have again that G acts on X. And uh, as before, so let X be an element in X. Uh, there's a bijection. Uh, I can take the coset space, G modulo GX, so the set of, so the group G, the cosets with respect to the subgroup GX of G. This set is bijecting, bijective to the orbit of X. Okay. So that's actually not a very, so in particular, if, uh, for instance, the orbit of x is finite, then, then so in particular, for instance, if uh, the number of elements in the orbit is finite, we have it is equal, then we have the number of elements in the orbit is equal to the index of gx in g. No, because the index is just precisely the number of um, uh, cosets. So, well, it's not, this is quite simple. You know, we, there's, you know, it's clear how to define the bijection. We have a, um, <coughs> so we define a map. So we want to define this map from this quotient to here, there's only one way how we can attempt to do it from G mod GX to G of X. So the only thing that we have is that we can apply an element of G to our element X. And this will map us here. So if we have an element here G times GX, so the, this coset, this should be mapped to G times X. So again, we have defined here a map from such a set of equivalence classes to somewhere in terms of the representative of it, this G. You know? So we have to see it's well defined. So if gx, gx is equal to, um, to h, so g prime, gx, what does it mean? What? Yeah, OK. <laughs> yeah, OK. It was a, it was a theory. Uh, uh, it was a rhetorical question, but in principle, maybe I should involve you more. <laughs> so <laughs> so <laughs> then, um, yeah, so this is equivalent to say that, um, I mean, either we can say that, we can either say what you say, or we can say more close to what? What? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's correct, yeah. OK. So we can say that, say, g to the minus 1 times g prime is an element in gx. 
No? So that we had defined, we had actually given an equivalence, as he said, we had given an equivalence relation on G, whose equivalence classes were the cosets, so which said that uh, these two elements are equivalent if uh, uh, this, uh, yeah, this satisfies this condition, so we can apply this. And so, well, so then if we take G prime uh, times x, you would want that this is equal to G times x. Um, this is equal to, no, I'm not quite sure I will get it right. <laughs> um, what do I have here? So, yeah, I mean, I somehow, yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay. <laughs> so, oh, we can maybe just say, so we can say, like he says, if we look at this, then, you know, this element is in the stabilizer. So it follows, you know, according to the story, so it follows that this is equal to x. So we have g to the minus 1 g prime x is equal to x, so we can multiply by g, so we get g prime x is equal to g times x. And so this, uh, and this uh, proves precisely that it's well defined. Um, So, um, in fact, we can, you know, so <coughs> we can see also that the map is injective because, in fact, uh, according to the definition, this is true if and only if this is the case. And, you know, this is if and only if. So it follows that this map is well-defined and injective. You know, we have that uh, in the injectivity one can also see directly, or you know, if uh, just turning it around, so if uh, g prime x is equal to g times x, then we have this. And so this is an element in the stabilizer, and then we have this, okay? So, um, so therefore, we see that this map is, we get an injective map here. And by definition, the map is surjective. Because we have said here that we send an element g times to x to g times x. So we get here all elements of g. So we get all g times x for g and gx. So the map is subjective and injective, so it's a bijection. Okay, so we get a bijection. Okay, and we, what time? Ah. Where is my, I know it's a bit, well, I can still try. <coughs> so now we want to use this to prove the so-called uh, orbit stabilizer theorem, which is somehow, some way how one can count how many orbits there should be. So it's not a very, it's kind of, none of this is very deep, but these are always useful things which one uses all the time. So first we want to talk about system of representatives, so definition. So if um, 
we have uh, that uh, the an equivalence relation uh, on a set X. So we call a subset R in X is called a system of representatives if it contains one element in every equivalence class. precisely one element so in every equivalence class. So say, maybe I say precisely one. Okay. And then we have the orbit stabilizer theorem which tells us well, how to relate the number of orbits. Um, so theorem to the stabilizers and the number of elements in the orbits. So what? Well, I don't you know, maybe. <laughs> okay, this is some simple theorem. Um, so this is called often orbit stabilizer theorem. It's again simple object observation. So let the group G act on a finite. Set X, also non empty, but whatever. So uh, then the um, number of elements in X can be written <laughs> either, so, ah, yeah, I forgot the system of, yeah, so let uh, R be a system of representatives. for the orbits, uh, then, so that means it contains one element out of each orbit, or it's a system of representatives for the equivalence relation, where two things are equivalent if they are in the same orbit. Um, so the number of elements of X is equal either to the sum over all equivalents, or all representatives over the uh, orbit, and this is equal to the sum, again, over all uh, representatives in the system of representatives of uh, the index of G X in G. Now this, um, I call it theorem, but it's actually trivial from what we know. So it's kind of useful because it often happens that uh, we know some of these, and then by this we know the others. So, you know, we know that um, these orbits are precisely the uh, equivalence classes of an equivalence relation. So it means that X is a disjoint union of the orbits. So it means that X is equal to the disjoint union over all X, small, uh, small X in R, of the orbit of X. The orbits are destroyed. Oh. And then obviously it follows that uh, the first identity holds by just counting elements. So thus first identity. And the second identity is also clear because we have seen that the number of, that the, the orbit is in bijection 
to the quotient of g by gx. So if it's actually, if the orbit is finite, as in this case, because x is finite, then uh, the, nu the number of elements in the orbits, orbit is equal to the index of g and gx. And second identity follows by the lemma, I don't know where, by previous lemma. by the lemma, which precisely said that uh, number of elements in gx is always equal to the index of g, gx in g. OK, that's all. So, um, so thank you very much. Are there Further comments, questions? Okay.